Edmund Barton was born on the 18th of January, 1849, in Sydney, in the colony of New South Wales. He graduated university in 1868 with a Bachelor of Arts, then his Master in 1870, before becoming qualified to be a barrister in 1871. After a failed attempt to join the New South Wales Lower House, he later succeeded in taking the seat of the University of Sydney. Before the seat was removed the next year, he moved to the electorate of Wellington, and he was their member until 1882. Then he moved to the seat of East Sydney, where he stayed until 1887. It is important to note that the economic discussion between free trade and protectionist policies was a major theme in politics for this time period. Australia wouldn't introduce low import tariffs until the reform era of Hawke and Keating during the 1980s and 90s. Barton was a vocal supporter of free trade. While he was the member for East Sydney, he was the Speaker for the Lower House. It was in this role that he met Sir Henry Parks, the man known as the Father of Federation. Barton's views for Australian Federation stem from his interactions with Sir Henry Parks and fellow leading Federalists of the time. In the beginning of 1887, Barton stepped down from his position as Speaker of the House and the seat of East Sydney to take a position in the Upper House. Then, in May of that year, turned down an offer to be Attorney General of New South Wales because he couldn't bring himself to concur in the financial projects of the government. In October 1889, Sir Henry Parks delivered his famous Tenterfield Address, the event that was the catalyst for the Federation of Australia. Barton publicly showed his support for Federation at a Sydney Town Hall speech the next month. In Melbourne 1890, the Australasian Federation Convention was held. Each Australian colony and New Zealand sent politicians to discuss union under the Crown. Barton was a representative for New South Wales. By the end of the convention, each representative committed to persuading their governments to consider and report on the scheme for a federal constitution. In 1891, Sydney held the National Australian Convention. However, the main discussion had turned to how rather than if the colonies were to federate. Barton spoke out against this change, stating that he thought it of the highest importance that just proposals be put forth. His reason being that New South Wales could lose the ability to govern itself to the extent that it did. The next set of conventions wouldn't occur again until 1898, seven years later. Side note, while New Zealand did take part in the discussions, they were ultimately uninterested in joining Australia. The Treaty of Watangi between the Crown and the Maori chiefs in 1840 was, while far from perfect, as all treaties between colonisers and indigenous people were, was a formal document between the two groups of people. This was not the case in Australia, as indigenous people weren't classified as Australians until 1967. Due to the mistreatment of Australia's indigenous people, similar concerns Barton had about New South Wales' loss of self-control, and a perception that there would be a loss of cultural identity, New Zealand chose not to join Australia. However, the two countries have continued to share close cultural links to the present day. Back to the 1891 convention, Barton had argued that each colony's rights should remain intact after Federation, that trade and intercourse shall be absolutely free, universal suffrage, as defined by white Australians at the time, and a representative Senate. He also became a member of the drafting committee for the Constitution, where he received praise for his work. Side note. The current system for the Senate has 12 senators from each state and two from the ACT and Northern Territory each. I personally believe Barton wanted a representative Senate so that New South Wales could continue to control a large portion of the country's affairs. Later in 1891, Sir Henry Parks lost the governorship of New South Wales for the last time and subsequently gave the leadership of the federal movement to Barton. The new governor of New South Wales, leader of the protectionist party Sir George Dibbs, appointed Barton as Attorney General. This proved a disaster for Barton, as the protectionist party were against his free trade ideals and weren't interested in federation. Furthermore, when the governor took a six-month trip to England, Barton was acting governor and covered the Broken Hill Miners' Strike. He refused to send in troops to squash the strike, stating that he wanted to avoid undue causes of irritation. However, he assumed that if the miners were to be tried in Broken Hill, there wouldn't be a single guilty verdict. This caused discontent with the Labour Party, and he ended up losing his seat in the 1894 election. This turned out to be a blessing in disguise for the concept of Australia at the country, as Barton spent the next three years campaigning for federation. 
By 1897, and after the death of Sir Henry Parks in 1896, Barton was known as the acknowledged leader of the federal movement in all Australia. He was the first to be elected to take part in the 1897 Australia Federation Convention in Adelaide, and was elected leader as well as chairman of the Drafting and Constitutional Committee. By the time of the last convention in 1898 in Melbourne, it was agreed that a referendum would be held in each colony to see if they wanted to become part of the Commonwealth of Australia. Each state voted for federation except for New South Wales. After the failed referendum, Barton's failed attempt to rejoin the New South Wales lower house, then a successful attempt, Barton was elected leader of the opposition. The previous leader of the opposition being Sir William Lyon, who was an anti-federalist. Eventually, another referendum was called and the four vote won 107,420 to 82,741. In March 1900, Barton was invited by Joseph Chamberlain as leader of the Australian delegation to explain their constitution to the UK government. After some back and forth due to the influence of special interest groups, on the 9th of July 1900, Queen Victoria gave royal assent to the act to constitute the Commonwealth of Australia. Former Governor of Victoria, Earl Hopeton, was appointed Governor-General. Barton was back in Australia by September, and was generally expected by everyone to be appointed Prime Minister. So, it came as a shock when the Governor-General asked Sir William Lyne, the anti-federalist opposition leader Barton had replaced, to be Prime Minister. However, no one was interested in being part of Lyne's government, so eventually Barton became Prime Minister on the 1st of January 1901. The first government of Australia was a turbulent time, especially for Barton, who wasn't too focused on the political manoeuvrings and games played within the system. He campaigned for moderate protection, so states could raise the money necessary to run their governments, proposed an old age pension, and most famously created the Immigration Restriction Act and Pacific Island Labourers Act, the beginnings of what's collectively known as the White Australia Policy. These foundations were well regarded in Australia, excluding Queensland, but especially favourably by the Labour Party, as they felt the competition between their workers and kidnapped slaves was unfair. Blackbirding. The method of convincing through either dodgy contracts or kidnapping people of the Pacific Islands and shipping them to Australia to work as manual labourers in slave-like conditions. Side note. The colony, now state that was the most dependent on the method known as blackbirding, was Queensland and was against the Pacific Island Labourers Act, not because it was an incredibly racist piece of legislation, but because they could no longer be able to take advantage of slave labour. While the Pacific Island Labourers Act did ensure the return of workers to their homes, it did nothing for the indigenous people that were to be treated just as poorly for decades to come. Some labourers wished to stay in Australia, but of the 10,000 labourers that were in Australia at the time, less than 1,000 were allowed to stay, and had to have identification papers to prove so. Other achievements of his government include the Acts Interpretation Act of 1901, the Standards for Drafting Future Bills Submitted to Parliament, the Audit Act of 1901, a method to review government spending, the Judiciary Act of 1903, the creation of the High Court of Australia, and the Defence Act of 1903, federal control of the Army and Navy, but not the Air Force, for the first flight wouldn't occur until 56 days later. Edmund Barton resigned as Prime Minister on the 23rd of September 1903, before becoming a judge on the High Court of Australia, where he would spend the rest of his life working. As a judge, he tried to maintain a balancing act between federal and state powers, and, in World War I, he was in favour of the federal government taking control of the civilian economy. Edmund Barton died of a heart attack in the Blue Mountains on the 7th of January 1920, 11 days from his 71st birthday. Extra Notes Edmund Barton got the nickname Toby Tosspot from the Bulletin newspaper due to his excessive drinking. From the 1st of January 1901 to the 10th of August 1967, Section 127 of the Constitution identified the Indigenous people of Australia not as Australians, but to be counted with the flora and fauna. As a member of the committee that drafted the Constitution, he is partly responsible for the poor treatment of Indigenous Australians for generations to come. In 1903, he tried to buy the New Hebrides, now Vanuatu, because it was French. When debating the Immigration Restriction Act in Parliament, Barton was quoted as saying, I do not think either that the doctrine of the equality of man was ever really intended to include racial equality. There is no racial equality. 
there is that basic inequality. These races are, in comparison with white races, I think no one wants convincing of this fact, unequal and inferior. The doctrine of the equality of man was never intended to apply to the equality of the Englishman and the Chinaman. Nothing we can do by cultivation, by refinement, or by anything else will make some races equal to others. Thanks for watching. Sources can be found in the description below.